I've been practicing, believe it or not, for about 28 years um, as a family doctor. I later realized, you know, let me get some extra training in obesity medicine since there's so many people uh, suffering for that. So I'm board certified in obesity medicine. And now I'm working on a master's in nutrition and functional medicine. So some of, you know, that guest lineup is really focused in a functional medicine space because uh, a lot of their mindset is about the root cause of disease. So when I came up with that little nest and rope acronym, uh, it really was speaking to, well, what are the root causes of disease? And what I'm finding is that if people really understand that, what they do is they, they tend to do better. They do better in terms of, uh, you know, recovering from chronic illnesses. I, I just tweeted something uh, this past week where I had a patient who uh, was seen in a hospital. And during that hospital stay, came in with a blood sugar over 500 and and he was, uh, you know, kind of borderline diabetic or so, uh, wasn't really making the lifestyle changes. And so they said, let's put him on insulin, which was appropriate. And they treated him, but then they said, you're going to be on insulin for the rest of your life. And, and so with my old way of thinking, I would have agreed with them. Uh, but you literally within a week, he was off of insulin using lifestyle. So, you know, <laughs> that, that's a big difference between my life is now uh, tied to insulin to um, off insulin within a week. So what we're trying to do is to create a, a world where people are aware, including the clinicians, that there is another way. Metabolic health, uh, where you reduce uh, the burden of the need for insulin, hyperinsulinemia, is a way of life that's better than one where you have that and then you depend on medicines and things like that. So it's really been really, uh, I just felt like I was reborn as a physician, because uh, now I kind of figured out these secrets of healing. So part of my, actually kind of re, you probably are not aware, but I kind of decided to call myself the metabolic health doc, <laughs> because I was like, you know what, if we, we have to get that word out there, metabolic health, and that way people who are maybe doing it slightly different, but they're achieving metabolic health, they're actually able to continue that. Um, I, and, I heard you mention something about your acronym and um, yes. protecting your nest rope. So can you just tell everybody what that is? Yeah, I know like everybody should know by now, right? But uh, it's kind of a, 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 a lucky uh, thing that happened to me. So I was, I, I kind of knew about the nest part, which is nutrition, exercise, less stress, more sleep and how we think. And I think I, uh, there's a tie between your diet and how we think in terms of what's the most important. When I started my training in functional medicine, however, I started to realize that there's more things out there. So the other uh, purpose of the T is trauma. And so I, so I changed it to that because the functional medicine tree, the roots have these different things we, sh we should think of as root causes. The rope came into uh, play and that's dealing with relationships. You got to have healthy relationships, otherwise you're going to be sick. You have to avoid organisms and pollutants that can harm you. And then, do our life experiences serve us? So, if we have life experiences from the past that don't serve us, we may want to put those to the side. And if we have life experiences that do serve us, we bring those to the forefront. And then the other E is for protecting our emotions. So, I the old version of Dr. Hampton would literally see a patient in an emotional you know, storm. And instead of addressing the emotional storm, I'm saying, you got to get your carbs under 20. You know, it's like, really, Dr. Hampton? So what I had to learn is that you have to address those things first. You may still talk about those things, but what you want to do is address their trauma. They've been traumatized in our health system, which is Advocate Aurora Health in Illinois and Wisconsin. We have a, you know, a trauma center. So we can actually refer people who've been traumatized rather from the ER or through the clinic to a trauma center. And then they have like a 16 week course, they put them through and they support them. And then maybe after that, they can have a conversation about low carb keto or carnivore. But before that, they just can't hear you. And I think doctors, uh, clinicians of all sorts have to be prepared to not be afraid of these things, which is one of the, 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 the the hard part is that there's some training. It's easy to just refer, but then there's, how do I have a conversation? How do I recognize they've been through something that I need to deal with? As a family doctor, we've been trained to kind of think about behavioral health, but we want to make sure all our clinicians are at least able to push the referral button to the right people. And that's, that's what I've been able to do. So it's been, 
it's been nice. So when I see patients, I, I'm always thinking about the nest and rope so that I can help them heal and recover from chronic illnesses. Uh, it's called behavioral uh, characteristics uh, and, to, and self-supported health status among 2029 20, adults consuming a carnivore diet, which is in quotes. And I think most of us in the low carb community are familiar with uh, Dr. David uh, Ludwig, and he has a couple of his other co colleagues on the in the uh, study as well. So the, the survey looked at their motivation, their dietary patterns. It looked at them, their, any symptoms they were having, et cetera. And so when they did the study, it had 2029, 20, so 2029 20, people who were involved and they were, uh, you know, average age was 44 and 67% were male. So, so, and the longest amount of uh, those who were reporting was about 14 months on the carnivore diet. It was somewhere between, you know, nine and 20 months. So on average. So anyway, um, um, so when they looked at the data, um, the prevalence of adverse uh, symptoms on that diet was uh, basically less than 5%. So if you think about that right away, so you have less than 5% of people had symptoms. So that was a good thing because that means that uh, even though it sounds really weird for those who are not kind of poor, you know, people tolerate it pretty well. And I know they tolerate it well because in my functional medicine training, it's, you know, it's like the perfect elimination diet. So when you eliminate all these processed foods, uh, people don't tend to have uh, a lot of problems anymore. So that's really cool. The other thing that they said of the symptoms that were reported, uh, they were things like gastrointestinal, maybe 5%. Uh, some people have muscular symptoms, maybe 4%. That's probably, we kind of know why that happens. Maybe the salt, magnesium, potassium, you know, being uh, uh, reduced. And some people had rashes, but that was only like in a uh, 1.9 or less percent range. So, but this is the stat that really kind of caught my attention. It said that 95% um, of the respondents had uh, high levels of satisfaction and improvement in overall health. 95%. And those who- so That seems really high. Like if you uh, talk to any, any collection of people doing Weight Watchers, Jenny Craig, Mediterranean diet, like, would you see numbers that high? Um, you won't. And what's interesting, I just had a conversation about Weight Watchers with a patient today, ironically, but, um, but what you find is, can you think of a drug that'll do that? I mean, can you think of, I mean, so this is, so it's kind of amazing that even with this type of study, which is not perfect, when you have those levels of success, that should prompt somebody in the scientific community to say, we need to dive a little deeper. There's something going on here. Maybe that person who thought the carnivore diet was an extreme diet should look at this and say, oh my God. Now we don't have to end there because in the abstract, it also says that the, um, the, the triglycerides were normalized and the HDL, which is a good cholesterol, were normalized. So, so the trigl now, now I want to remind people, now they did say that the LDL cholesterol was slightly elevated, which is no surprise to anybody in the low carb community. And what I tell people is we have to look at the big picture. Uh, you're losing weight, your metabolic uh, it, let's let's remind people what metabolic syndrome is: your blood pressure, your blood sugar, your waist circumference, and the triglycerides and HDL. If all of those things are getting better, the LDL becomes something we have to pay attention to, but it's less important. And all clinicians who are more metabolically uh, aware would also know that the LDL and cholesterol doesn't mean as much because that's why it's not even in the metabolic syndrome diet, you know, like criteria. We want to know what type of LDL you have. Is it a small particle, large particle, small being things we don't like versus the large? Uh, those things are important. But if you just look at a, a, a cholesterol panel and you only focus on the total cholesterol and LDL, which is what a lot of conventional stocks do, you really miss the big picture. So, but I want to say they also reported that the there were reductions, of course, in BMI. There was weight loss. The A1Cs were reduced for the diabetes and then. Um, and the medications um, were reduced. Now you won't believe this stat, 84 to 100% of the respondents had uh, basically a reduction or stopped using their medicine for diabetes.
That's insane. So the conclusion of the study said, contrary to common expectations, 